funny. I'm not, I'm not a techie, and I sit down, uh, and I go through my slides 10 times, and I go down the night before, and I find out that I made mistakes on things. Uh, this just basically is how does quality medical medicine deal with infection? Well, the medical treatment of infections, first, identify the microorganisms. Second, the appropriate antimicrobial. Let me go back. Identify the microorganisms. Usually, if you take a child into the emergency room, they have a severe sore throat, run on a high fever. What you will do, what the doctor will do, is draw a culture off the throat. They already know it's probably strep. They'll start a treatment, but the reason they draw the culture is so later they can change treatment rather than see that child die from the wrong treatment. We do a microscopic slide, which differs from a culture. A microscopic slide is where you take a little bit of the plaque down the pocket, and we're going to talk about that because that's key to this whole treatment. And you put it on, a mic on the slide, cover it with a cover slip and seal it, and look on a phase contrast microscope for a bacterial infection or amoebic infection. That's how we do it. If we want to, if we have a severe, more severe case, don't bother writing this down, this is coming up on slides, we will do a culture uh, before we start treatment. The culture goes off to one of two places in this country that we'll talk about. And, uh, sorry, Kathy, I keep saying that. She tells me, don't say, keep saying you're going to talk about it. But anyway, that culture will identify the microorganisms and will identify what antibiotics will kill them if you need an antibiotic in addition to what we talked about before, the allicillin oil of oregano. Allicillin is garlic extract. So that's the difference between a slide and a culture. Doing the same thing as good medical treatment here, folks. Appropriate antimicrobial. You use an irrigation, which contains an antimicrobial, and your culture results if you need a specific type of antibiotic for the specific infection. They go over home care instructions. They'll tell you what to do with the child with a sore throat again. Gargle, what to drink, what to take. We talk to people about irrigation and brushing. <gasps> he didn't mention floss. Oh my God. Well, you can't lasso the bacteria and pull them out. So what we want to do is kill them. We want to kill them. Doesn't matter what you use to kill them. If you can get them dead and prove they're dead with a laser, with ozone, with herbs, I don't care what you use. I don't care, as David Kennedy says, if you grab them, throw them on the floor, and kill them. Kill the bacteria. Scorch and burn. We use irrigation and brushing. Support the host resistance. Medicine does that in various ways. In biocompatible periodontal therapy, we do it with good quality supplements to boost that immune system, to get the person working again. Why do they have a weakened immune system? That's a seven-hour lecture. Remove, not remover, remove the local ir irritants with irrigation and cleaning, and they track treatment progress. Take your child to a pediatrician in a week and let's see how they're doing. Uh, we like to see people every three or four months and do slides on those people after treatment. I do slides every treatment after doing biocompatible periodontal therapy until I have four consecutive clean slides. Now that's how good medicine treats infection and also how good dental medicine does it. We're not that different, folks. That's why we're a branch of medicine. The history of periodontal treatment is a little interesting to throw in. You, all of you, those of you who have been here and heard me speak before have seen this slide, but it hasn't changed. You look down through this and you see that in the 1950s, and some of us were in school then, I was a little after that, thank God, but some of you were, calculus, tartar, was considered the cause of periodontal disease. It's what originally led to pocket elimination therapy with surgery, okay? It has nothing to do with it. Yeah, we want to get calculus tartar off the teeth, but only for a couple of reasons. One, it's an irritant, causes the gums to swell, just like a splinter. Two, it hides the plaque underneath it. And three, it makes it hard for us to get down to the bottom of that pocket to treat it. So yeah, we remove it. General plaque we went through. We went through specific plaque, looking at different than not the attached plaque, it's the free floating plaque. Now we're down to specific microorganism, bacterial, viral, yeast, bacteria in there, I'm including protozoans, like Entamoeba gingivalis. Dr. Jenko, Robert Jenko, very famous periodontal researcher, he said there are, there are three reasons for surgery. Access to the roots, access to the bone to clean and graft, and any pocket greater than five millimeters. I say, I was asked to not say bogus. I say all don't really apply. What are you going to do when you get to the bottom of the pocket? How does new bone form? Unlike David Kennedy, I've mellowed. 
so I don't use bogus anymore. Just kidding, Dave. Um, what are you going to do to the bottom of the pocket? How does new bone form? That's an important question. How does new bone form? In pocket elimination surgery, and I'll probably mention this again several times, important points I try to do that, when you've had your courses in the pocket elimination surgery, do they not teach you to go in there and remove all that tissue? Okay, how does new bone form? New bone forms from the coaction of osteoblast and osteoclast. Osteoclasts clean up the bone that's ready to go. It's old bone, it's diseased bone that comes in and destroys that, carries it away, the body eliminates it. Osteoblasts form new bone. They lay down the whole matrix for new bone. Where do osteoblasts come from? Come from, and this is the PhDs, pardon me, I know this is way oversimplified, but it's easier for us clinicians. It comes from undifferentiated mesenchymal cells. Where do you find those in the body? Well, one of the places you find them is in granulation tissue as the body tries to save itself by laying down new bone. Well, if you remove all that and don't grow new bone, duh, there's a reason for that. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to remove all of these. So I would say none of these reasons Dr. Jenko mentioned really work. There are two means of diagnosis in dentistry. One is the traditional method. They do probings, look at tissue tone and bleeding. I do all those. I do all those. Probings on every patient. Look at the tissue tone. Note the bleeding. And I should have said suppurative tissue. That's another one. You can write in your notes. If they're suppurative tissue, you've got a problem. But microbiological, we add in some things. We do the microscope exam with a phase contrast microscope. We do the culture and sensitivity. And this microbiological is biocompatible periodontal therapy. We do culture and sensitivity, send it to the lab, know the names of the bacteria, know what kills them, and we may do blood studies. For instance, a fasting blood sugar. There's nothing wrong with anyone in this room doing a fasting blood sugar. You can even have the patient do it themselves. Important to know blood sugars. Uh, one fasting blood sugar does not a diabetic make. There are a lot of different tests for it, but it might be nice to know because if they do have a blood sugar problem, it's going to complicate the treatment. And you might want to consider functional medicine tests. I should add that in, functional medicine tests. We want to know what causes this particular problem in this particular patient. Now, you notice that I said probings. Yes, I do those. But there's problems with probings. And the problems with probings is that, and this is a couple slides here, the pocket is not the disease. It is a result of the disease. It's not even a symptom. Pockets are signs. You know your order, cause, symptoms, signs. Okay. It's a sign. A pocket shows that there is something wrong. Something's going on. Shallow sites, two millimeter probings are not protective. That's where the start, that's where the disease gets started. It originates there. One of the most exciting things in doing this kind of therapy is to have a younger patient come in who has no probings. They may have or may not have bleeding. The tissue doesn't look too bad, a little red, a little inflamed. And you make a slide and you find they're crawling with organisms, crawling, okay? You look at that, you can treat that, it's really easy. One or two treatments in the office, home care, if they'll do it, and we'll talk about how to get them to do it, that will clear that up. It's not fancy, it's not expensive, it's easy to do. So it's important to know that even in shallow pockets, you want to know what's working in there. That's where it originates, get it before it gets started. Deep pockets themselves can be risk-free and stable. I could show you in my clinical files literally hundreds of patients who have deep pockets that never resolved, never filled in, but they're risk-free. You do a slide, there's no bacteria operating in there, and they're stable. The tissue looks good, everything's healthy. And the standard deviation of repeated measurements, probing measurements of the same site, ADA research, same site by an experienced examiner with a probe. These were all periodontists. And they all, you know, they all know better how to use a probe than you do. Their hygienists know better how to use a probe than you do when they're working in the periodontist's office, not in your office. But anyway, I digress. The standard deviation is 0.8 millimeters. So for a change in attachment level to be significant, it has to be two millimeters, two millimeters. That's how much it varies. If you have the probe going this way, you get a deeper pocket than if it's that way. We've all seen that. You can turn a two millimeter pocket, sulcus into a five millimeter pocket by changing the angle of your probe or by using a really sharp probe. 
So we know that probing cannot distinguish between high and low risk infections, and it's not predictive of future disease. It identifies historical disease sites, and it's fraught with measurement error, plus or minus the two millimeters, okay? Plus or minus two millimeters for the standard error according to the American Academy of Periodontology. Four millimeters? It's a lot of distance, folks. A lot of bacteria can live in that. So probings are important, but definitely don't determine your treatment. Now, we also know from research done by uh, Dr. Loesch and Grossman at Michigan back in 2001, the challenge to us in dentistry is not proving that dental periodontal disease is an infection, but of implementing treatment and diagnosis procedures, diagnostic procedures, based on the fact that it is an infection. If it's an infection, our old treatment and diagnostic methods from the 1950s no longer apply. We have to move beyond that, and today, that's what we're doing. Dr. Nash, a physician up in Canada, and I should have a better reference on this, I don't have it on this slide, wrote an article, it was actually an editorial, and he says, why are dentists, this is a physician, an MD, medical deity, why treat the first 20, centimeter, 20 centimeters of the alimentary tract different than the rest? Medicine does not treat infection of the rest of the alimentary canal the way that dentistry has conventionally treated periodontal disease with pocket elimination. When you look at the way we treat periodontal disease, if you cut out the pockets and cut out all the tissue and cut out the bone, it would be sort of like if you had a lung infection and the, the surgeon said, well, we'll remove the lung. Not that much different. And you don't want to be doing that. So we want to treat it the same as the rest of the alimentary canal, which means medical treatment of infection. Microbiological diagnosis consists of two things for the diagnosis, microscopic examination, and if necessary, a culture and sensitivity, and I'm going to tell you how to determine whether you need that second one. But always the microscopic examination. Let me assure you, if you do not have a microscope, you cannot do biocompatible periodontal therapy. You cannot do it. Microscopes today are not tremendously expensive. You need a microscope, you need a monitor to go with it to teach the patient. And I'll, I'll justify that for sure. You'll understand that very clearly. You must get a microscope. I'm really disappointed. I was shocked today to find out that Bill Landers of Oratech isn't here. Bill has been just a, a guiding light from the very beginning days of Dr. Kai's. He's worked in it. He's been at all our meetings. He had a conflict and couldn't make it. But he's a good one to check. Check with Oratech, and he can tell you about the microscopes they have, how you can get them, how you can pay for them, how you can use them. He has films for help and determine what you're looking at on the microscope. Now, some of you are sitting there saying, you know, I've spent a fortune in my practice already. I just had a guy tell me about using lasers. I'm going to have to buy one of those. I've never used one. But how can I afford a microscope? Well, it pays for itself very quickly. Let me give you an example. Say that you get an upper end scope with a monitor, everything you want, and you spend $5,000. You figure it yourself if you're doing a $25 slide on each patient that comes in, and this is good treatment, it's the way to diagnose. You're doing a $25, $35 irrigation of the full mouth to kill all those bacteria before you start scaling the teeth and putting those bacteria in the bloodstream and you're creating biocompatible periodontal therapy patients that you're going to treat, as we're going to talk about, over six patients, over six appointments. Add up the money. Two of those patients pays for your microscope. After that, it's gravy. If you don't believe that, agree to give your hygienist all the money generates after that. Good way to do it. So you've got the, those things that are going to pay for it. Just two treatments will pay for the microscope. So that's, a, that's a, a, a not anything to be considered. What do you look for on the slide? I hear that question all the time. It's really hard to explain unless I can have you one-on-one -on -one to look at the slide, unless you get a hold of Bill Landers at Oratech, O-R-A-T-E-C, and you say you need his uh, tape on microscope interpretation where he talks you through a bunch of slides. It's incredible. It's really good. But you're looking for activity. A healthy periodontal pocket, a healthy sulcus, will be calm when you look on the slide. There's no activity. There's not all these bad guys running around shooting each other. It doesn't look like a Cecil B. DeMille production. 
You'll look for spirochetes, little wiggly things. You'll look for amoebae. Entamoeba gingivalis, it sends out little pods out of this little circle. Looks almost like a white blood cell. No cytoplasmic granules, and it sends out these pods. You'll look for cigar rods, which are real little things that look like tiny cigars that move around the slide real fast. And you'll look for yeast cells. That's basically it. So spirochetes, amoebae, cigar rods, and yeast cells. But get that instructional tape from Bill, and you'll learn everything you've got to know about it. Now, one of the questions that comes up about white blood cells, and this may differ a little bit from Bill's uh, tape that he has. White blood cells can be used to do different things. Number one, if somebody comes in and they have pockets, they have bleeding, they have suppurative tissue, they have all these things, and you, well, let's forget suppurative tissue, that wouldn't be. But you can't find a lot of white blood cells. You see all this activity on the slide, but there's no white blood cells. That's a worst case scenario. What that means is the body has now decided the only way I can eliminate this infection is getting rid of the teeth. I'm pulling my troops back. I'm giving up Fallujah. And that's the pockets. You want those white blood cells in there working. So if you have a real active infection and there's no white blood cells and there's all this activity, that's bad. You can get it back. You have to be really, really cognizant of getting that immune system working again. But if you have uh, a lot of activity and a lot of white blood cells. That's why I write down the numbers. And it's, you know, and TNC, whatever, greater than 100, less than 50, whatever. That's good because the white blood cells are still in there fighting. And you're just going to go in in your treatment and help them. And boy, they are so much better than you are. They're better than anything we have available. So the other thing we might find is someone who comes in with real bad infection, no white blood cells, a lot of activity on that slide. And after our first initial couple treatments, we go in and we find less activity, but tons of white blood cells. That's good. They're in there cleaning up the battleground. So that's what you want. So they can either show infection or they can show healing, or the lack of them can show healing, or it can show that you're losing the battle. You've got to determine where you are in that, in that whole thing. And again, I hope that's really clear. Uh, is that clear, Kath? Yeah, she thinks it's sort of clear. That's good. Okay, and I'll answer any questions you have about that. Now, culture results. When I put in the paper points down in the pockets, okay, and I want to make a culture, I put them down in there, I let them have 15 seconds or so to soak up the, the liquid coming out of that pocket. It soaks up the bacteria, and I send them off to the laboratory. And we'll talk about the laboratories. I'll give you a couple examples of what you can do with this. And I look for these top five on their results. If you have this top one, you have got a battle on your hands. You can win it, but you've got to know that. Now, I explained the difference between a slide and a culture. I think everyone knows that. The slide you're doing right in your office, you're looking on the microscope. A culture is where you actually take the material and send it off the lab. But this is what I want to know. These things are important, but these bacteria let me know I've got a bigger bacterial infection. So this slide, a culture, does not show a viral infection. There's an easy way to uh, differentiate between that uh, that we'll talk about in just a moment. When you send off your culture, there's two places you can really send it. And in the notes uh, next to Advanced Dental Diagnostics, uh, what it should say in there is their website is www. Oh, it is on there, www.addx.us. Last time Tom uses dark purple. Um, A-D, A-Aaron, D-Dog, D-Dog, X, dot U-S. Not dot com or dot net, dot U-S. I like this company. The other one is Temple University Oral Microbiology Testing Service, which is www.omts.com. And the phone number for OMTS is 800-788-OMTS. The phone number for ADDX is 866-810-6090. 866-810-6090. I sort of like, at this point, advanced dental diagnostics. And the reason I do is because what I've found lately, I worked with OMTS for many years. I've had some great results working with them. I don't degrade them, but what I've noticed lately is it seems like it's taking too long to get the cultures back. Some of these things are running three weeks to a month. I want them in under two weeks because I want to have that culture before I start treatment. 
to know what I'm getting into. I want to know if you've got that AA in there. I want to know the level of Porphyromonas gingivalis before I start cutting around in the gums. Not cutting, but fooling around in the gums. So it's taken too long to get them back from ONTS. They're inaccessible by phone. It's just impossible to get them to return phone calls lately. I don't know why that is, and I haven't been able to get an answer. And this one does a DNA probe. Metametrics Laboratory, which does the porphyrin profile that I talked about at the last meeting for a diagnosis of toxicity, they are now doing a new stool test. You guys aren't interested in that, fine. But what it does is uses the DNA of anaerobic bacteria to identify them because they have found that when you do this culture, and, and the bacteria that cause dental disease, dental periodontal disease, are uh, anaerobic, you lose about 85% of the bacteria just doing the culture. They die from the oxygen from the mouth to the, to the tube. So ADDX looks for the, the DNA and can give you the numbers off that. It's just, I think, at this time, a little better way to do it. But I wanted to offer both of them because I have worked with Temple and Tom Rams for many years. Now, when do you culture? I talk about culture. I would culture, culture all cases before treatment. Before treatment. Why culture after if you're killing them? If they're periodontitis class 3, 4, or 5, according to American Academy of Periodontology guidelines, you can log on to their website. They've got the guidelines for determining class 1, class 0. I've never seen that. 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. Now, you say, well, class 5 you can't treat anyway. I have a lot of patients, folks, over 15 years who still have teeth that were condemned as unsavable by periodontists. 15 years, class 5 periodontitis, and they've still got their teeth. My prize case is one who had six teeth that I said, she was told by a periodontist, have all your teeth out. She had like 25 teeth. I told her she had to have six out. She refused to have any out. Three years ago, she lost one of those teeth. And of course, I used the opportunity to say, see, I told you. I am a good diagnostician. But she has the other five still in her mouth, which is really good. What the culture does, what the culture does is tell you what the enemy is over the hill. Again, to use the, you're in a war here. Periodontal infection is a war. And before you start sending your troops in, whether it be white blood cells, the irrigants you use, your curettes, whatever you use, it's good to know what the enemy is over the hill. Any of you who have served in wartime areas will know that they always want to know, before we send our troops over that hill, are we going after a bunch of ragtag uh, natives of the area that have bows and arrows, or are we going after a highly armored division, or are we going after ground-to-ground uh, uh, -ground missiles? Important to know. Actinomyces, actinomo, actinomycetum comitans happens to be the ground-to-ground -ground missiles. Some of the other things are just ragtag people. But most of them are pretty serious. So that's what a culture does. It identifies the enemy and then tells you what weapons will best kill it. That's important to know. Now, I talked about bacterial infection. We've always discussed this. But you know, a lot of these cases, not a lot, a few of these cases are viral. We know that we have ANUG cases, cytomegalovirus, all the herpes viruses can get involved in a periodontal infection. It obviously complicates the issue. You can't culture it well. It's expensive to culture it. But you can look for certain signs and symptoms that we use. Site specificity. If you've got periodontal infection, really virulent infection, that involves just the first molars, or just the first molars and lower anteriors, you've seen those, and it's really vicious, it's painful, it looks bad, you look at a cold sore on a lip, Put that in a periodontal pocket. You think that doesn't complicate the issue? Sure it does. It also complicates the pain. But site specificity, bacterial is more spread out through the mouth. The viral seems to have site specificity, and I don't understand that. It just is a fact. Periodic nature of the infection. Boy, Doc, my gums flared up a couple weeks ago. I couldn't get in to see you. Now they feel fine, but it was a couple months ago they flared up. Periodic nature. Bacterial and amoebic type of periodontal infections are pretty straightforward. They keep going. They keep going. They're chronic. Viral's a little different than that. Bilateral characteristics, I talked about both sides, extremely painful. Inability to control. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story.
that I was at a meeting where uh, it was the uh, Paradigm Symposium, uh, one of those invitation-only things. They had a temple when they were for, uh, founding a chair for Paul Kais a number of years ago. And Jorgen Slots from Southern California talked, and he was the first one I remember that brought viral into periodontal infection. Walter Loesch from Michigan was sitting right behind us, and when Jorgen was showing this slide of what the viruses do, Dr. Loesch leaned forward and said to me, Tom, can you, pardon me, I, oh, it's on tape, I won't say it. Can you, do you believe this BS? Interpret how you want. And I looked back at him and I said, well, Walter, I do because I have a couple patients he's talking about. I couldn't get anything to work. So I used povidone iodine on them. These are the only two things we know, we know kills viruses. Povidone iodine, and I'll tell you how to dilute it, or bleach. This, uh, try to stay away from it, it tastes awful. <laughs> but I went back to my office after I heard Dr. Slots talk, and I used povidone iodine on these patients, and I was allergic to iodine, and overnight, overnight, their gums were better. Not in a week, overnight. Things got so much better because it went in and killed the viruses. So although they're hard to find the thing that kills them, once you do, they go. But I know that it's true. I know that Dr. Slots was right. Now, Braun, in the Journal of Periodontology back in 92, with the Braun brush, said, subgingival irrigation of pockets, which is what we do with BPT, one to six millimeters deep with a pulsated power irrigator using a subgingival irrigation tip is effective in delivering a solution up to 87% of the pocket depth. This is significantly better than that produced by rinsing, which averaged 21%. The average person rinsing is about 5%. But this was concentrated, teaching them how to really, you know what I mean, really flushing it in there, holding it in there. Bad news for Listerine. Listerine has a lot of bad news. If you've been using that for periodontal disease, get rid of it. 25% alcohol, 25 to 27% alcohol. What it does is tear the tissues up, and it really doesn't work because it's not strong enough to kill the really bad bacteria. So I would, I would not use that personally. Uh, I recommend against it. But with, this is with a pickpocket tip. If you're using these thin cannulas, and now again, I get mine from Oratech. I know we're not supposed to talk about companies, but I know that you also want to know where we get these things. That's where I get mine. Um, we can put that cannula down to the base of the pocket. 100%. We're 100% killed. We can go into Furcas. We can kill in there because we can aim the tip in there and spray it out. Ciancio, Dr. Ciancio up in New England, Journal of Periodontology, 1989. Not only is oral irrigation effective in reducing the bacterial infection, but, quote, the addition of a chemotherapeutic agent led to greater reductions in plaque and bleeding to a moderate decrease in bacterial counts. That's in office and home. Now, this experiment they did was using a straight tip only on the water pick or Viajet and at home. It was not done by a professional. So they said they had significantly greater reductions in plaque and bleeding and moderate decrease in bacterial counts. We're going to have total decrease in bacterial counts the way we teach you to do it. So remember, that was at home, no office intervention at all. Journal of Cl Clinical Periodontology, Sacolari. Poor absorption of orally administered tetracyclines may account for much of the variability in clinical response to antibiotics in practice. Okay. Before using any antibiotic, except for that garlic extract and oil of oregano or olive, or olive leaf, whatever you want to use there, before you use a, a pharmaceutical grade antibiotic, you should do a culture to determine what works for this particular infection. If it's an emergency treatment, the odds are clindamycin works very well. Clindamycin is the most powerful bone type of antibiotic the dentist conventionally used. So you have your culture to tell you what works. But when I put these two together is because tetracyclines, including doxycycline, 90, over 90% 90 of the antibiotic prescriptions written by periodontists are written for doxycycline. It doesn't work to kill peptostreptococcus micros. Go back to your slide. That's one of the five bad ones. It doesn't kill it. It kills it in vitro, but not in vivo. So when they actually start culturing after, it says on your lab report that it works. Don't use it. Don't use tetracyclines anymore. We've got too many other antibiotics to use. I don't have time to go in those today. 
uh, but I can help you with that if you want outside. We go to the Journal of Periodontology back in 1998. Now notice these are, I'm using a lot of old slides because I want to show you this has been around for a while. Porphyromonas gingivalis shows up in pockets of different depths suggesting that shallow perioprobing depth may not indicate health. That's what I just said earlier in the, in the talk. Actinomyces, actinomycetum comitans is not probing depth related. And I hope I don't have to say that again. I don't, that's a hard word to say. These two facts indicate the need for intense, more intensive monitoring and persistent treatment. Obviously, slides, seeing people more frequently, and trying to keep their gums cleared up. Um, at some time, I think I'm going to talk about this, but I'm going to say it now. Porphyromonas gingivalis has actually been cultured. Think about gingivalis. Does that give you a clue where it comes from? It's actually been cultured in the plaques removed when they do bypass type surgery. When they clean out the arteries, they pull that plaque out now and they've cultured it and they find P. gingivalis. You're dealing with a serious systemic infection. It's not just sick gums. Back in 1997, Journal of Periodontology, bacterial survival negatively affects the short-term clinical outcomes of both non-surgical, microbiological, biocompatible, and surgical conventional treatment. Well, sure it does. That's what causes it. If you leave the cause, the odds are it'll come back. And that's interesting because true biocompatible periodontal therapy done with a microscope, with irrigants, doesn't let the bacteria survive. Surgical treatment, conventional pocket elimination therapy has nothing to do with the bacteria. Nothing to do with the cause at all. Irrigants, cross that off, forget that. That's just too much to use. It's too difficult to use. Uh, it clogs up your machines. Uh, I had that because that was the original one that Dr. Kais recommended. We're way beyond that now. I like to use Therosol in the office. You can use bleach. Again, that just tastes terrible. Um, Therosol is a proprietary product available from Bill Landers at Oratech. I probably use that in 85% of my adult patients. And I irrigate basically every single adult before cleaning, unless they have no signs and symptoms of periodontal disease and I've never had a positive slide on them. Then I might not irrigate them, but that's probably 2 to 3% of adults. The rest I irrigate so that when I'm clean, I don't introduce that bacteria in the bloodstream. I use Therosol 85% of the time, povidone iodine 15% of the time. Bleach tastes terrible. Real quick story, I'm running out of time. I don't have that far to go. Uh, the first time I used, uh, I did the irrigation years ago, Kathy was my patient. I used povidone iodine, she got done, she said, well, it wasn't unpleasant, it wasn't too bad. And then I used the bleach, and uh, she said, don't ever do that to me again. Uh, divorce lawyer didn't appear, it's sort of amazing. But that's what, if I think it's viral, I will always use povidone iodine diluted 50%, 50% with distilled water. 50% povidone iodine. 50% distilled water. If they are allergic to shellfish or say, yes, I'm allergic to iodine, I don't use it. It's controversial whether this is really a cause of that allergy, but I don't use it. I might, if they have a serious, what I think is a viral infection, then insist on using bleach. One teaspoon in a whole bin of the Viajet or uh, water pick. One teaspoon of the bleach. That's all you need. I also use at home one that's not listed here that Bernie Schechter over there has. And that's called under, um, under the gum concentrate uh, by the Dental Herb Company. Uh, Bernie's number, well, they've got a booth out here, so I don't have to give that to you. 800 uh, 747 But that's what I have almost all of my patients using at home. It tastes great. It works. It's a great tissue conditioner. It's great to have if you have a cut, a little zit, some kind of infection going on in your skin. Let me tell you, this stuff clears it up like nothing else. Okay, the secret of success of BPT, prevention. Prevention, oh yeah, prevention. And remember, there is nothing that the dental professional can do that will make up for what the patient will not do. Okay, you know that. You know that. The cardiologist who can't get a person to quit smoking or, or exercise, hang it up. He's not truly MD medical deity. You've got to have cooperation. 
The Handbook of Adult Lifespan Learning was written by a woman named Patricia Ald at Towson University in Maryland. For behavior change to succeed, people must, one, have a reason to take action, two, feel concerned about their current behaviors, and three, believe a specific kind of change will produce an outcome at an acceptable cost. But most importantly, four, people must feel capable of making and maintaining that change. There is nothing like handouts, bleeding, color of the gums, and before and after slides shown on a TV monitor to convince them. Get a monitor with your microscope. Don't cheap out here, folks. Don't cheap out. Get a monitor. That, those tools will let you take care of all these things to get the change you want, to have the patients cooperate with you. Tools we use in oral hygiene, a water pick appliance, soft bristle toothbrush, proxa brush, and a stimulator, like a rubber tip. That old school of thought really does work. That's what I use. You can use a Viajet instead of a water pick. I don't care about that. Any kind of soft bristle brush, whatever you like. Host resistance or susceptibility. I said we have to have a healthy patient to have this work. Supplementation of the diet. It's almost impossible to get a good, high-quality uh, amount of vitamins and minerals in your diet today. The land has been farmed out. Uh, too much of Monsanto, not enough of God. So supplementation of diet. Immune system boosters, including probiotics, uh, so the reason I say probiotics, the good bacteria for the gut, 75 to 85% of the immune system comes from the gut. Dan and Yogurt's ad for Dan Active is right. Not necessarily in the product, but in what they say about the immune system. Uh, you may need to use antibiotics, culture dictated only when absolutely necessary, but make sure you know what you're using. Blood studies or functional medicine tests, if you use an antibiotic, if you give a patient an antibiotic for any reason at all, I consider it on the verge of malpractice to not give that patient or sell that patient a probiotic. If you're going in there to clear an infection up and killing the bacteria that form the immune system, get bacteria back in there and do it. Give them away from the antibiotic, but you must use probiotics if you give an antibiotic. I don't care what the reason for the antibiotic is. Your doctors now, let's move on. Let's get up to date. Functional medicine tests with the blood studies, whatever you feel comfortable doing, refer to a holistic physician or nutritionist. There's a hotel right next to my nutrition office. You can refer them to me. Now, why is host resistance so important? Pasteur said it best. Woe betide the pathogenic organism that tries to attack a healthy body with a healthy immune system. Your body, if you create a situation where the body can heal itself, it will heal itself. Again, some Rams and Slots work from Periodontology 2000, almost a symposium type uh, thick journal. Conventional mechanical surgical root debridement does not eradicate pathogenic microbes from the subgingival ecosystem, possibly due to their invasive potential into epithelial cells and connective tissues. The microbes will move into the epithelial cells, connective tissues, including the bone, and hide. Peridol pathogens may recolonize surfaces from reservoirs in the tongue, tonsils, and buccal mucosa. McLeod, interesting, from the journal American Dental Association. It's a radical journal. Surgery did not significantly improve tooth retention in patients. Tooth loss may be related more to the type of periodontal disease present than to the treatment rendered, or also to the treatment rendered. That's important to know. Patients with periodontitis are 72% more likely to have coronary heart disease when all other factors are accounted for. Can I have an extra five because of the technical thing? Thank you. Thank you. 72%. You're not treating just sick gums. You're treating sick people. You're really unfortunate, those of you who haven't heard this before, you cannot leave here today and not know this. Total mortality is 2.12 times as likely in patients with periodontal disease. How do you tell the type of periodontal disease? Culture and sensitivity. This is why ridding the infection is number two after emergencies, an infection that can kill. I even put it before removal of toxins because isn't it easier to get rid of those amalgams, do good restorative dentistry on healthy gums, no blood, no seepage, the journal Stroke, that says it all. The journal Stroke, in stroke cases, this, they actually said this in this article, 
Only the dental factor is causative and significant. Obviously, there's factors smoking, overweight, toxics, toxic patients, but that's what they said about dental factor. The risk of stroke is two and a half times as high in people with periodontitis. Therefore, the treatment of periodontal disease offers a new way to prevent stroke and heart disease. And that's what I told you about porphyromonas gingivalis in the plaque. It causes an inflammation of the uh, artery lining, and the body sends in cholesterol, which I'll bet Mark Houston tells you can be really good to have, and it settles around that inflammation area of the artery. That's why you get the heart disease from periodontal disease. Medical problems associated with dental infection, periodontal infection, well, these are all of them. Or all that I know now. Heart disease, stroke, preterm low birth weight babies, pregnancy gingivitis, stomach ulcers, diabetes, brain abscesses. Just had a young child with an abscess tooth, not periodontal disease, die in Baltimore because the dentist didn't treat him for it. You think the dental boards are bad. Let me tell you about uh, Schaefer, Hein, and Levy Law Firm. Prosthetic joint failure, that's why we premedicate people who have prosthetic joints, subacute bacterial endocarditis, that's why we premedicate people who have valvular problems. But how much better, I know you still have to premed if that's what their doctor wants, but if you've irrigated everything out, it's all cleaned out. Those bacteria aren't getting to the heart, aren't getting to the joints. You've irrigated them free. I'm not passionate about this or anything. <laughs> Evidence of a bacterial etiology, etiology a historical perspective, perspective. This is, to me, from Periodontology 2000, Volume 5. This, they summed the things up. Sokransky and Hapagy, wonderful, wonderful article. The sine qua non of periodontal papers backs up biocompatible periodontal therapy and puts it in a nutshell. The question, according to them, in their, this is from their articles, no longer whether microorganisms cause periodontal disease, but rather which specific organisms are responsible in the specific patient. The pathogenesis of periodontal disease is a pathogenic flora acting on a susceptible host. So you've got three concepts of treatment that are important. Remove the pathogens. We've talked about that. A good irrigator does wonders. Get down to the bottom of the pocket with a cannula and flush them out. Alter the host response. We're going to talk about these individually. And reduce susceptibility of the patient. Okay. On removing the pathogens, we've got a few slides. I use six appointments for treatment. That's my treatment of biocompatible periodontal therapy. I start, first appointment, we do the culture before we do anything. We irrigate before we do anything. We do a growth scale to get the tartar out of our way so we can better treat each quadrant. And we teach use of the water pick and proper brushing, which will reinforce each time. Every time I see them, the first thing we do is irrigate full mouth, full mouth. Do you think these bacteria, if you're treating a pocket up here, don't know how to get down here? Someone once asked me, when I put, went back there to ulcers, how Helicobacter pylori, which is mostly found in the buccal mucosa, gets to the stomach. And I said, I don't know if you can hear this, but oh, swallow. There they go. They're in the saliva. That's where they live. So that's how they get down there. So we irrigate full mouth pre-treatment every time. We anesthetize a quadrant. This is after the first appointment. This is appointments two through five, two, three, four, five. Anesthetize a quadrant so the patient doesn't have pain and treat that quadrant. If they're not allergic, I use iodine, and then I will use therosol or bleach if the allergy is present. I tell them about the bleach. Let them have a little taste. Let them make that call. But we know that it's effective. I end each appointment by taking CoQ10 powder. Remember I talked about CoQ10 uh, capsules with collagen synthesis, which is so important for the heart, periodontal disease, arteries, nerve sheets. I take the powder, mix it with a little olive oil, take one of those little brushes we use to put on the uh, 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 acid exchange or the, uh, uh, you know, to treat teeth for bonding. I take that little brush, I take the powder, and I get it, pump, pump it down in those pockets because the same thing, it works systemically and locally to help new collagen tissue form. I'll get a slide of a treated quadrant, like if I do the upper right to start, if I'm doing the lower right next, I'll get a slide of that upper right. Let's see how it's responding. Let's see how it's doing. No more than two weeks between appointments, max. I'll end the sixth appointment with a full slide, irrigation and polish, and determine whether I have to use an antibiotic by the patient's response. At least I know which one to use, so I only have to use 
three to five days of it. Home care is imperative water pick and brush, and we change their brush at every appointment. Those brushes carry infection. So we change the brush at every appointment, getting cleaner and cleaner as we go. Okay, again, remove the pathogens. Best way of checking as to whether you're making progress in disease eradication is with a microscopic slide. A very thin curette. You know those old curettes your, your hygienists always throw away? Keep those that are really worn and really thin so you can slide down in that pocket as much of the bomb as possible and pull out the plaque. Those big, huge, heavy 13, 14s won't go to the bottom of a pocket when they're brand new. So you get good samples for your slides. And then make sure you don't remove all the granulation tissue. Remember, your undifferentiated mesenchymal cells forming osteoblasts. Okay, again, removing the pathogens. You must get to the bottom of the pocket when irrigating. If necessary, mark your irrigation tip with the pocket depths. If you know there's a couple eight millimeters, mark that tip and make sure you're getting down there seven to eight millimeters and flush it. Don't worry about the tartar as much as the specific plaque. Get tartar off. I'm not saying don't do that, but that's not the sine qua non of periodontal treatment. Irrigation must break through the biofilm. They form this little biofilm around them to protect themselves. Irrigation will break through that and kill them. That's what we want to do. We want to kill those bugs. Again, removing the pathogens, that first one that I said of con uh, con concepts of treatment. Consider natural antibiotics, such as garlic extract, oil of oregano, cinnamon. Uh, olive leaf uh, extract is good. If using any kind of antibiotic, use a probiotic with it, keeping up 75 to 85 percent of the immune system. And forget this one. Uh, I don't want to get into explaining that, and you don't need to know. Uh, that's for someone dealing with some different things. Alter the host response was the second thing, a good supplement regimen and good diet, the four rules of nutrition. Whole foods, mostly plants, not very much, organic free range, as pure as possible. Gets the host immune system strong. Reduce susceptibility, oral irrigation at home, proper sulcator and interproximal brushing, and three to four months prevention, prevention, prevention in the office. You can determine that by uh, what you're finding on your slides when you see them in three months. I have some that I moved to four, a very few I've moved to six, some I moved back. I play by the slide, what the slide shows me and what the tissue looks like. So remember that you're dealing with an infection that is life threatening. The doctor must be involved. I can't tolerate the offices. I gotta tell you, that's why you're the doctor. When people come in and say, why are we doing such and such, how many of you have said, well, my name's on the door? Great. But you've got to be the main one directing this battle. You're the general. The hygienists are out there fighting that battle, and they can do this treatment. I'm not against them doing this treatment. Okay? The biocompatible periodontal therapy, they can do. But you have to be involved. It's a life-threatening infection. It's a matter of time until a major lawsuit brings down some dentists. It may already be happening, but I've got to tell you, you're treating an infection that's important to treat, and you can win this battle. I, this, this works. It just works. At this time, you should be able to understand the causes of periodontal infections, systemic, local, environmental, understand how to diagnose periodontal disease using 2008 scientific standards, how to do treatment that works, and leave this lecture and go to your office and know what you're doing. And I'm always available. Uh, I didn't put my email on here. My website is www.wholebodyhealth.us. Those of you who are my age, I'll say whole body health is one word. Younger people just laugh. Uh, and my email is TEB for Thomas Elmer Baldwin, TEBKEB -E for Kathleen Ellen Baldwin, tebkeb at md for maryland.metrocast.net. T-E-B-K-E-B -E -E at M-D dot metrocast dot net. Some of you have the old one that's Terps. It's no longer Terps. They had a losing basketball season. I will not have their email. <laughs> but, but that's how you can get a hold of me. And thank you very much. I'll be here at the speaker's symposium later.